It is Wednesday, October 10th, 2018. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And it was a very short Get Your Ass Kicked at Jiu Jitsu Wednesday. <sighs> Apparently, one of my my lesser grooming habits managed to catch up to me today, and I split my big toenail. <sighs> Fortunately for me, it wasn't actually during a roll because those things tend to go where, like, it happens and, like, you keep going because you didn't see the extent of the damage and then next thing you know, you're bleeding all over you, you're bleeding all over your partner. It's just not a good thing. And so, uh, yeah, I uh, decided to uh, quickly escape the mat and uh, go take care of business because I'll tell you what the thing was sticking straight up the half that was split off that broke off it was sticking straight up and I mean I, I could just imagine you know kicking somebody with that or whatever it would have hurt both of us so I decided to uh, kind of edge on the side of caution there and uh, try not to be a a real big ego, egotistical man about it and just stay on the mat and endure the pain. And, you know, there's a time and a place for that and it's usually when you're, uh, when you got some money on the line or something like that or, or at least your honor. Um, but no, not during practice. So yeah, I, um, this is very, very short. As far as, uh, is what we covered as far as materials go, um, before the incident, we were covering some nice little escapes um, for uh, if somebody's got you in half guard, half guard escapes. And um, I really liked the second one because it was like a, a smash pass kind of gig. And, you know, I'm a heavy guy and it, it allows me to be kind of lazy for a moment and uh, just put my weight on my opponent and get the hell out of there, you know. But I, I couldn't get it right, though. There was, there was something wrong on the... On the second one that that we were doing, where you have to shift to one side and then like you have to bring bring your opponent's legs all the way back over to the other side, and I was I, I kept missing that one, and I ended up having to go like the long way around to get around to my opponent's back. So uh, yeah, that's definitely something I'm gonna have to work on a lot. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I had a lot of fun right up until I split my toenail. These things happen, you know. It could have been a much worse injury. I'm glad it wasn't. And, uh, yeah. You know, it was kind of a, a top to a, an altogether... Uh, how should I say this? Uh, not bad day. Um, just a day I wasn't really looking forward to because I've been uh, taking down my plants. And, uh, you know, it's always kind of a sad thing. You know, you've been growing them for months on end and they get beautiful and they get huge and then you got to cut them all down and kill them and it's uh yeah it's kind of it kind of sucks you know because I, I do get a lot of joy from going out there opening that door and the first thing i see is pot i mean what's what's not to like about that and so uh yeah i had to do a, a little bit of a takedown today and i, I gotta say that the the stuff that i took down today is probably like the easiest i've ever had to process fortunately there wasn't a whole lot of it it was just an itty bitty plant because i got it into the ground way too late but you know it's it's one of those things where it's kind of a live and learn kind of thing you know where i knew i wanted to get into the ground earlier this year and so i i went about every possible way i could to get to facilitate that and the one thing i didn't do and it's it it kind of bugs me because it's completely against my nature, especially with regard to trading cryptocurrencies, is that I kept trying to defer to other people, you know, getting friends to help and so on and so forth. And the fact of the matter is, is after after I really got into the swing of getting the work done, uh, I, I didn't need anybody else out here. You know, the, the job that I was doing, it, it was made easier to have one one person on to hand me stuff and whatnot but as far as like you know doing the actual work and whatnot it didn't actually require more than one person so and just something to take to heart for next year that you know come 
come April, you know, instead of looking for somebody to help me get the thing up, I'm just going to do it myself, and everybody else can go fuck themselves, because, you know, one of the, the things I kept running into is, I get people out here, and they work great for one day. The second day, they wouldn't be quite as on it, and, and by then, I, I just lose patience with it, and, you know, just like, dude, I, I should not have to keep coming out here and telling you this shit. You know, I, I'm, I hired you to do a job. I'm getting ready. I'm going to pay you. So get off your fucking ass and get it done. <laughs> you know, I mean, I didn't have anybody actually sitting around on me, but you know, they weren't doing the work, and it, it just, it got to the point that you know, it just pissed me off too much, and and I finally stopped looking for people to help me out. But in the meantime, it ended ended up costing me months as far as like the the aggregate time that everything could have been in the ground and all that it, it literally cost me months so lesson learned not going to happen next year what i'm really hoping is that i did a good enough job skinning the the greenhouse that the plastic that i put up there will actually last throughout this winter if it does that i won't have to put it up again won't have to strip it down and it'll be a, just a matter of churning up my soil getting all the crap out of it and uh getting rolling for the year and and really that's what i'm that's what i'm planning on doing this year it just balls out if i can keep the keep the roof up i will um if i don't though and this was this was a neat little thing that came out of constructing it the way that i did i'll be able to actually address the the roof on like a modular basis and and that was something that I couldn't do last time because I I made the roof with one big contiguous piece of plastic. Big mistake, big mistake. Way more trouble than it was worth. And I fought the thing the whole time. And I mean, you just you can't imagine, man. You got a thirty foot by ten foot st- strip of plastic flying in the wind, fifteen mile an hour wind will not stay down. You got to like staple it to shit, and then you're putting holes in it that you don't want, and it's just a whole big pain in the ass. And so this year, um, I, I took it down a notch and did contiguous pieces, but just from one side to the other. You know, from like the the left side of the roof all over the the peak to the right side. And what that allows me to do now is, if there's an issue on just one of those strips, I don't have to take the whole roof down. <laughs> so, you know, a few a few very important lessons learned by taking it down and and rebuilding it. But uh, I'm I'm definitely gonna have to do something as far as getting like a scaffolding. Um, just to make it easier to work around on the um, on the roof. I mean, it's just too big a pain in the ass to have to keep going down, coming up, going down, coming up, going down, coming up. And, you know, if I had a high enough platform, you know, something that was about nine, ten feet tall, that I could just like whip it out like a set of ladders, you know, and and uh, put up a platform that was really close to the the roof so I can work on it. Then uh, it would be much easier. So. That is something that I'm that I'm considering how to do this this uh, this winter while I'm have the opportunity to take things down and kind of kind of straighten them up a little bit. But you know, like I said, we did a really good job as far as skinning it, and there's only just a few little pieces of it that that are left to be completed before I expect it'll be able to make it through any storms that we have this this winter. Um, but, uh, yeah, I learned a lot in just redoing it. And I, I think this is something that we can actually bring to cryptocurrencies that it seems to me that a lot of people are just willing to accept previous mistakes and just try and patch over them. And I think the problem with that is that the people that tend to do that, they're, they're not the original people that, that were working on the the uh, software, and you know it's. I, I think it's just because too many coders have gotten used to just copying and pasting other people's work, and using other people's libraries and shit, that they they just accept that, you know, the previous person did their due diligence. You know, they went through and they got all the bugs, and this is ready for production. No, 
No, it's not. And we're going to find that out repeatedly in cryptocurrencies. And unfortunately, it's going to be expensive lessons. And I, I happen to believe that the trip we are going down, or maybe going down, it really depends on how it, how people react you know, to the latest developments, whether or not they just accept what's being handed to them and uh, try and keep up with with uh, Blockstream's bank of miners that they've got going on. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. And on the other side of that, I've got a few articles that I really want to get into today. So, as far as what we're going to do for our first dance, um... We, I, I did body count. Did I do? Bo- yeah, I did body count last time. So, I want to kind of mix it up a little bit. Don't want to, don't want to wear that one out too much, right? Well, you know what? We did have clutch here recently, and uh, I did not get the opportunity. Apparently, they played in Portland last night. Um, the, yeah, I had some some issues around here that prevented me from being able to go, but. Oh, well, I'm hoping that uh, they'll get that town straightened up, Portland, that is, um, before the uh, before the contortionist comes. But, uh, yeah, part of, the, uh, part of the reason I didn't go up to Portland was that apparently the mayor has decided to not do anything about Antifa. And Antifa, these people are so fucking stupid, they have no idea what, what fascism even means. You know, the 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 use of violence in pursuit of uh, per, pursuit of political ends, specifically by the state, but it can be practiced by anybody, is more or less fascism. I mean, there 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 is more to it than that. Yes, I know, but the attempts to uh, violently address people, I think that's just stupid. It's certainly not anything that I want to do with have anything to do with because put in that kind of situation I really think I would just shift it into low and hit the gas you know where these morons are walking out in front of and blocking traffic and shit in the middle of the city I mean Portland hates drivers to begin with but this is just bullshit and like I said it, it, confronted with that situation you, you better best hope that I'm not in the driver's seat because I'm going to make a pancake out of your ass I really don't give a fuck why you're in front of my vehicle. All I know is you're impeding my progress. And that's not tolerable. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. And I wanted to play... I'm going to play some Clutch. And uh, what song, though? What song indeed? Um, I would play X-Ray Visions, but I play the shit out of that. Space Grass. I'm about to get ripped. It seems good. Space Grass. First dance here on Coin Metal. And that was Strapping Young Lad with Detox. <sighs> and so, it's been kind of a shit day on the markets. Um, really interesting stuff, honestly. Uh, mostly because of the timing. And uh, I just noticed this other thing. I was looking at these uh, the prices for cryptocurrencies right now in this in this chart here on uh, Altcoin today. And if you take a good look at it, it's really interesting. It, it, you go to USD, everything is in red, right? You go to euros, everything is in red. You go to Chinese yen, Bitcoin is up. Everything else is red including USDT <laughs> and then and then you go to uh, great Great Britain and and again everything is red so that, that, that leads me to wonder you know I, I really I really have to I have to wonder about that I wonder if in Chinese markets they have not had this uh, stable coin boom which which we've had here in the United States and elsewhere. Um, I see. I, I think that the the whole purpose of of such coins is to depreciate the value of Bitcoin. 
you know, if you don't actually have to have the U.S. dollars to back up the tether that you're buying Bitcoin with, it doesn't matter how many of them you have, right? Or, or that you claim to have. You could, you could just print off more of them. And, and this has always been a risk with, with tether and other quote-unquote stable coins. See, they maintain the illusion of stability, or at least if they're making any effort to do so, um, they maintain the illusion of it by by false indications. Basically, I mean, if you look at if you look at Tether, they they basically did all kinds of dancing to indicate that they actually had the the U.S. dollars or have the U.S. dollars. Um, and I guess uh, HSBC is uh, taking up the the reins as far as who's going to allow Tether to bank with them, and I don't know how to take that. Honestly, I don't trust HSBC. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the mafia just said that they're going to allow <laughs> allow Tether to bank with them. You know, I mean that that's that's not a a vote of confidence if, if you're if you're not paying attention. Anyway, so I I think that basically all of these quote unquote stable coins are just a bunch of bullshit. You know, if I don't have to have the U.S. dollar reserves for the volume of whatever it is, and as soon as you're you're dealing with an abstraction, that's <coughs> that's the risk <coughs> that the creator or person who is maintaining it will debase it. It's why we we got Bitcoin to begin with. They fucking have, they've been debasing every fiat currency on the planet. So why? any fucking monkey on planet earth finds trust or has faith in any of the banks that that are in in fiat currencies i have no fucking idea i mean it, it, it's like a a, a sugar coated turd here eat this no i don't want to eat it it's a sugar coated turd it's still a fucking turd i don't care if it tastes sweet for a moment or two it's a fucking turd the same fucking thing with HSBC coming in under the co- the the tether coating, right? <laughs> Whatever. These people were fucking counterfeiting money to begin with. Now they're going to counterfeit the volumes that they're they're going to be supplying to their counterfeiter in in crypto, i.e., tether. <clears throat> yeah, like I said, if if you're deriving any kind of additional confidence or or comfort with regard to that. You're a fucking idiot, and and, and we're going to indicate it now. See, I think that we're starting into a uh, profit-taking cycle, or or continuing, rather, in a profit-taking cycle of several entities that have been artificially inflating the markets. And see, I was expecting a, a dip on Bitcoin Cash. I was expecting a significant dip on Bitcoin Cash, but that was the only one that I was, I was really watching for it. And it, it seems that was a mistake because a, a considerable amount of bloodletting has been going on today. And we're going to start this one off um, from Altcoin today. Sorry, I had to rehydrate just a tad there. <clears throat> Crypto bears dump $15 billion as markets plunge again. Markets are bleeding crypto again. XRP, Bitcoin Cash, and Tron dropping double digits. A moment in the markets has been long over... A movement... My apologies. A movement in the markets has been long overdue. And it came today as the crypto bears dumped $15 billion. Cryptocurrency markets have plummeted over the past couple of hours to drop precipitously close to $200 billion and their yearly lows. Bitcoin played the Pied Piper leading the, t- leading the drop when it fell through key support at 6550 an hour or two ago. Bitcoin is currently down 5% on the day and falling. Its current price is $6,300. A bigger dump came for Ethereum, which has lost 9%, dropping its, dropping its levels back down to 205 
like the digital lemmings that they are, the altcoins predictably followed suit. And the top 20 is a sea of red right now. In the top 10, XRP is the biggest loser with a fall of over 11%, just above 42 cents. Bitcoin Cash is a close second, dropping 10% to trade at $460 uh, $460. The rest have lost between 7 and 9% in this latest route. Further down the chart is a bloodbath. Tron, NEM, and VeChain are all dropping 10 to 10 to 11 percent right now. The rest are are all as, <laughs> in as bad shape as IOTA, NEO, and Tezos are falling seven to nine percent. Why is Tezos even in existence? They've got such major major issues behind the scenes that if you haven't taken your money out of them, uh, you, you like pain. Or you've got just enough faith that they'll they'll actually make good on something at some point or another, and it may it may happen, but I I, I don't consider it very likely. Anyway, continuing on, there's only one altcoin defying the drop at the moment, and that is Eternity, which is made eight percent on the day to trade at one dollar and eighteen cents. The launch of a recent Windows mining bounty could be keeping AE afloat. With, while all those around it are sinking. The biggest losers in the top 100 at the moment are Denticoin, Noacoin, uh, Moac, and, and Walton Chain, all dumping 13 to 16%. Total market capitalization has declined 6.8% over the past 24 hours as they fell back to $204 billion. <clears throat> In the last couple hours, one big plunge saw $15 billion eliminated from crypto markets as the bears pounded them again. It has been the largest daily dump for over three weeks, signaling that the route is not over. Bitcoin dominance has crept back up to 53.5% as the altcoins bleed out again. FOMO moments is a series section that... Uh, yeah, whatever. So, uh, yeah, there we have it. The, um, the whole cycle of money, you know, monetary value, as it comes into and out of Bitcoin. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I, I just saw something that would explain what's going on with the markets here. But anyway, um, yeah, the uh, cycle of money as it flows into and out of crypto, um, it's a, it's an observable event, <clears throat> but with regard to this one in particular, um, it could be read as a dip before a boom, or it could be just a dip, <laughs> a dip before a further dip. <clears throat> you know, we we don't know for sure. Um, but anyway, the uh, the cycle is is pretty uh, pretty observable. But the thing is, this this one in particular is a little different. Because it's not just happening in altcoins. As this article indicated, the, the movement downward actually started in Bitcoin. And, you know, so it, it, in my mind, that's just a lot of people watching their, their charts way too closely and overreacting to what they see. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of people that are, that are waiting for a big event. You know, they don't know whether it's going to be a big event up or a big event down, but it's going to happen. At least they think so. I, I think it'll be a whimper, honestly. There there have been enough factors introduced into the markets to uh, easily uh, distort them and uh, keep everybody guessing as to what's really going on. And I think that's kind of a dangerous place to be because it it's at that point that we start looking for experts and these experts are often very very myopic they have their own view of the markets and the they're they don't have a a large enough perspective to draw a a real conclusion and so they basically say what people what they expect people want to hear you know so they say shit like, oh, the markets are fine, you know, we're, we're just going through a mild correction right now, and then, you know, in a, in a week or two, we'll, we'll have recovered the losses and, and, and be back into forward movement. <laughs> and P 
people will trade that. You know, people will stay into coins and stay into stocks that they, if they really took took the time to do the homework, would understand exactly what's going on with the coin and or or stock or bond or whatever, and, and make a a rational decision on, on what to do with their money. You know, and it, it is unfortunate that such a a tiny minority of the market actually does their own homework. You know, they often rely on hedge fund managers and not just hedge fund managers, but fund managers in general, money managers in general. And um, I think that's a big mistake because these people run in herds too. You know, you, you run in a herd and you get wrecked. They run in a herd, they get wrecked. Only they're getting wrecked with your money now instead of you getting wrecked with your money. And if you get wrecked with your money, you're going to be a lot more sensitive to what's going on than if they are getting wrecked with your money. Because they'll do things like give your money to a best friend of theirs for a kickback. <laughs> and, and and really, do you, do you need that in, your, in the back of your mind? Go, is, is Jimmy Joe going to gonna stoke out his buddy over there at HP or, or Microsoft or something like that and give them a, a ton of my money so that they can sell their fucking stock at a profit. Give me a break. Anyway, so n- the, the next one, and th- this, this one, it, it's the, uh, where was it? Here it is. This one's on uh, coindust.com, and this one supposedly, this, this is the one that started it. Now, see, it, it, this isn't really the one that started it, but I'll, I'll go into further why. Anyway, so here we go. Bitcoin drops $400 in 30 minutes as price volatility returns. And this is by Sebastian Sinclair, and it was authored October 11th, 2018. So apparently, Sebastian is from the future um, at 313 UTC and yes, penis. Bitcoin, the world's largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization, dropped 4.77% on Thursday, pushing prices well below the 6400 mark for the first time in weeks. At 0058 UTC, just after Wednesday's close, the cryptocurrency shed $400 over the course of 30 minutes, a move that found it crossing 6400 for a time. Uh, for a time, the market's most reliable lower bound support for the first time since September 12th, according to Coindesk price data. You know, whatever, I'm using these bullshit markers to determine movement. At press time, Bitcoin has lost momentum, having stalled briefly at around $6,038 before crossing back above $6,200. The volatility marked an end to stable trading that had been ongoing since September 17th, with prices in between caught at with prices in between caught in a $300 range. After the levy finally broke, the pressure proved too costly for the bulls who had who had conceded their losses and watch as the price dropped in quick succession. The top 10 cryptocurrencies by market capitalization also took a hit, dropping between 4 to 13% on the back of the Bitcoin sell-off. XRP suffered the most, dipping 12.34% while other major names like Ether and Bitcoin Cash dropped 10 to 11%. The total cryptocurrency market capitalization also performed a nosedive, dropping 13.1 billion in a total value of in total value over the course of the two and a half hour span. People's taking some profit. Yeah. <laughs> and so there you have it. You know, I'm. I've been looking at this, and and I'm thinking, you know, this isn't just this isn't something that's happening just in crypto. These are, this is like institutional money evacuating out of the market. You know, and you got to wonder exactly why they're doing it. I mean, because when you take it into account, we're and we're going to be covering 
next what I think is the the big thing that caused the real big sell-off here in, in cryptocurrencies. And it's mostly because people want to make money, you know? <laughs> and who wants... Who, who'd blame them for it, right? But, you know, the, this, this next correction that we're going to talk about, this one, number one, I don't think it's done. And number two, I think that... Uh, it's it's pretty significant it, and an indicator also that what's going on right now in Bitcoin and, and and cryptocurrency markets is has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. Nothing. And and don't fool yourself into thinking, you know, that just because your your portfolio is primarily cryptocurrencies and the thing is really kicking you in the dick right now that it has anything to do with you and, and this this is this next article ought to, ought to give you some some hints and this one's on uh, cnn.com <coughs> markets now and this is by Paul Paul R Lamonica um, CNN Business updated 9.05 p.m. Eastern Time, Wednesday, October 10th, 2018. So, yes, penis. The title, Dow Falls 830 Points in Third Worst Day by Points Ever. New York. The Dow plunged nearly 832 points on Wednesday, the third worst point decline in history. All 30 Dow stocks were in the red, sending the index below 26,000 points for the first time in a month. The index fell by more than 3%. The S&P 500 posted, posted its fifth straight decline, plummeting nearly 3.3%. And tech stocks got hit particularly hard. The Nasdaq dropped more than 4% in the worst percentage decline since June 2016. International markets followed the downward trend. The Nikkei was down more than 3% in, in morning trading on Thursday. Stocks are in the midst of a scary October slump sliding sharply because investors are worried about rising interest rates. October is, has often been a nerve-wracking month for investors, and this month is living up to that reputation. All three indexes are in the red this month, but NASDAQ has really taken it on the chin. It has plunged nearly 8% already in October. The Dow's point decline was the worst since February when the index fell by more than 1,000 points twice. Or $1,000 twice. The Dow's percentage decline doesn't crack the top percentage declines. The index fell 23% in 1914 and on Black Monday in 1987. The technology sec uh, select sector, SPDR fund, a proxy for the tech sector, plunged more than 4.58, sorry, 4.85%. That hadn't happened since August 2011. Why stocks are plunging? Tech is taking its, its lumps be because bond yields have climbed up in recent weeks, hovering at more than seven, a seven-year high. Although that's largely because the U.S. economy is so strong, the spike in rates for the benchmark U.S. 10-year Treasury has investors wondering if the near-decade-old de near bull market may be finally ending. Higher long-term rates could slow down red-hot sectors of the economy, including technology, especially as the Federal Reserve seems intent on raising short-term rates for the foreseeable future. Higher rates increase borrowing costs, pinching corporate profits. Investors may want to shift out of momentum and into more defensive stocks, companies that aren't as expensive and also pay healthy, stable dividends. 
Continued worries about a slowdown in China's economy, especially as trade tension between the United States has escalated, were also dragging down the broader market. Who's up and who's down? Tech leaders Amazon, Facebook, and Netflix all helped lead the market lower Wednesday, while, while stronger companies like food companies, Smuckers, SMJ, and General Mills, GIS, Gold Miner Newmont and Bargain Retailers Dollar General and Dollar Tree finished the day higher. But there were few places to hide on Wednesday. Only 17 stocks in the S&P 500 wound up with a gain. Even utility stocks, which tend to pay big dividends, fell slightly on Wednesday. Apple, Boeing, Caterpillar, and Nike Dow stocks that have a significant presence in China were among the bigger blue chip losers on Wednesday. Volatility has returned with a vengeance. This <coughs> Sorry about that. The CBOE Volatility Index, or VIX, the market barometer often dubbed Wall Street's fear gauge, surged nearly 40%. And the CNN Business Fear and Greed Index, which looks at the VIX and several other indicators of market sentiment, plunged into extreme fear mode. It was showing signs of greed just a month ago. What to do when the market turns south? Some experts said this isn't a, a time to panic. And, and those experts are probably counter trading you. They're probably shorting your stocks right now. The pullback, particularly for tech stocks, is indeed argued. Joe Heider, president of, of Cur is needed. My apologies. Argued Joe Joel Helder, president of Curus Wealth Management. The sell-off is healthy, Heider said. Since the market bottomed in March 2009, it's been more than 10 years of growth stocks leading the way non-stop. Investors were, quote, selling first and asking questions later, said John Augustine, chief investment officer with Huntington Private Bank. Augustine added that with earnings due out from big banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo on Friday morning, investors will look for new market sectors to take the lead from tech stocks. In theory, banks should do better if the Fed keeps raising rates and bond yields climb higher since it will make their loans more profitable. And Jeff Alexander, the president of RM, RM Davis, a wealth management firm, said he wasn't getting nervous about Wednesday's market madness either. As long as earnings and the U.S. economy are continuing to grow, this market pullback will wind up being a healthy dip, Alexander said. The relative lack of volatility was a bit troubling. This slide was long overdue. Quote, We've scratched our heads about the rise in stocks for the past 18 months, but this is nothing to be overly concerned about, Alexander said. Um, I, personally, I consider this a misread. <laughs> you know, they, they might be going, going back up in the shorter term, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, this is this is just the beginning. <laughs> you know, they, you, you invest to make money, right? Well, at some point or another, you have to take the profit. You know, you can't just watch it fucking rise. At some point or another, you do have to sell. But now, let's uh, let's take another look at it at a different side of this and this this one's actually on zero hedge <clears throat> ground zero will the dollar shortage kicks kick off the next financial crisis hmm i wonder if this has anything to do with it and this is by uh, palisade research authored uh, wednesday, uh, wednesday october 10th 2018 no indication of genitalia let's just go with it Oh, wait a minute. Uh, this was via Adam uh, Tumorkan of Palisade Research. So, yes, penis. There's an old saying. You can't fight the dollar. And I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. You can't fight the dollar. 
And what this means is, because the world's chained to the U.S. dollar, thanks to its reserve status, everyone's constantly affected by whichever way the dollar value goes. If the dollar declines, then foreign economies and currencies get a boost from the inflow of capital. But if the dollar rises, then the opposite happens. Foreign economies and their currencies sink. You can understand why then so many countries today are peeved with the Federal Reserve's tightening. They're all suffering from the unintended consequences of a stronger dollar. I've written about this problem before. Foreign central banks from all over the world, such as Argentina, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, and many more, are all defending their own local currencies against a stronger dollar. Those that borrowed trillions of dollars are exposed here. A rising dollar against their own falling local currencies creates a mismatch between liabilities, the rising U.S. dollar, and assets, their own weakening currencies. Also keep in mind that as rates rise, the dollar-indebted foreign corporations and banks are all feeling the pain of increasing borrow costs, borrowing costs. For instance, I wrote last week that onshore bonds, def bond defaults in China just hit a record high as liquidity gets tighter. That's why today, as U.S. interest rates rise, especially as of late hitting a seven-year high, <clears throat> and the dollar gets stronger, the global cost of capital keeps getting more expensive. Thus, putting it simply, overseas investors and corporations are finding it increasingly difficult and costlier to get their hands on dollars. And yet, so far, the market doesn't realize just how costly and scarce U.S. dollars are becoming. Quote, the cost of borrowing dollars, especially offshore dollars, will continue to rise, putting considerable pressure on global financing conditions, says Shweta Singh at T.S. Lombard. Quote, the main threat to global financing is an offshore dollar squeeze. This, in my opinion, will kick off what's set to be the next global liquidity crunch. Just, just a look at the previous crises, and there's a nice little graph there. As you can see, one important feature it was one imp important feature that was present during the past crisis was a chronic shortage of dollars. This eventually led to the Federal Reserve to pause their tightening and instead began setting dollar liquidity swap lines with many foreign central banks to help ease this problem. Putting this into context today, since 2007, the dollar credit to borrowers outside the U.S., excluding banks, was 9% of global GDP. Now, now it's at 14%. So, with the world even more dependent on U.S. dollars and the Fed today, this coming liquidity crunch will be felt much worse than earlier times. And it's already happening, uh, already beginning to We've already seen the emerging markets getting slaughtered this year. With U.S. yields and the U.S. dollar rising together, this will no doubt stress countries without the ability to print dollars, which is everyone besides the U.S. And the, rem the remaining but shrinking pool of available U.S. dollars is drying up faster and faster. I've written about the reasons for a dollar shortage months, months ago in the anatomy of a crisis, a strong dollar, and disappearing liquidity. You can read it here if you haven't. I wrote, quote, Putting it simply, the soaring U.S. deficit requires an even greater amount of dollars from foreigners to fund the U.S. Treasury. But the fund is shrinking their balance sheet, which means they're sucking dollars out of the economy. The reverse of quantitative easing, which was injecting dollars into the economy. This is creating a shortage of U.S. dollars, the world's reserve currency, therefore afflicting every global economy. This is going to cause an evaporation of dollar liquidity, making the markets extremely fragile. And since then, the evaporation of dollars has only worsened. The Treasury needs more dollars than ever than ever as deficits continue soaring to levels not seen since 2008.
dot dot dot. The Fed's ramping up their quantity, quantitative tightening, sucking dollars out of the banking system. This is pulling out as much as $50 billion a month or $600 billion a year. Also, because of the Trump tax cuts, we've seen corporations take their cash piles back home. This suddenly yanking dollars out of foreign banks that were once, quote, tax havens. It gets very dim where we add everything up. I can almost hear the noise of a sponge sucking up all this liquidity. As I wrote above, all the soaking ups happening during a time when the world's never been more dependent on US dollars. The worsening dollar shortage today will most likely be ground zero for the next financial crisis. This isn't a pretty picture. The charts in this article belong to our like-minded friends in South Africa, Mr. Blah Blah Blah. Okay. <clears throat> and there's some comments here. Let's check out what those are really quick here. Ooh. Let's try this first one here. This is by um, Consuelo. Also, because of the Trump ta tax cuts, we've seen corporations take their cash piles back home. The suddenly yanked dollars out of foreign banks that were once tax havens. Are there real numbers out there to substantiate this claim? Like, how much? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see here. Let's try King Tut's here. The, the low interest rates have all but destroyed pension funds in this country. This was caused by the Fed's low rates. And the only way to address it is to raise rates. Slowly enough, that funds can respond fast enough to save some of them. We are faced with an entire generation of elderly that cannot take care of themselves in old age. That won't be cheap. They are effectively transferring pain from our retirees to emerging markets. Retirees vote. Emerging markets don't. Yeah. Let's see what else here. <laughs> Here's one for you. This is by uh, Kenilworth Cookie. I think it was Jamie Dimon that said recessions happen every seven to eight years or so. And yet as a country under Greenspan, the music kept playing, the drinks kept flowing, hand over, hand over the reins to cheer Satan Bernanke, and a few years later, boom, subprime explodes. Everything connected. Let's fix the mess, wash the hands of, of the banks, and voila, no interest rate rises during the magic shitstorm eight years until after the 2008 election. Don't fix the real problem. It's never been about liquidity. It has always been about solvency. Two different economies. The Wall Street one, everything is awesome. Markets up. Housing up. 401ks up. And then the real economy. Food and energy. And insurance costs up. Wages not keeping up with real inflation. And jobs shifting. Now to more, to more a part-time Amazon-based type, type of work. So... Jerome Powell trying to fix the fuck-ups of Chair Satan Bernanke and Chair Satan Yellen has slowly started to raise rates to unwind the QE and taper that those, those before him caused. And the bond market has taken, taken note with yields going up, especially on the two-year note. So, what do you want to try to save? The bond market or the stock market? The stock market is always the last to figure it out, as Treasury Secretary John Connolly once said, quote, it's our currency, but your problem. Got dollars, bitches? For they will be in extreme short supply soon. Yeah. Take that profit, kids. That's what they're doing. <clears throat> oh, here we go. And this was by Dark Purple Haze. Hmm. It wasn't that long ago that lots of experts were talking about QE and how the world was being flooded with trillions of, uh, in US dollars. But now there's a shortage? Yes, there is. My point being is that these are relatively new narratives, US dollar shortage post QE. 
almost always are the exact opposite of what someone was breathlessly telling us years before. Like how QE could never end, rates could go up, and the stock market was toast back then. And now look at the at 25k plus. The metals were the place to be because the US dollar was a weak and withering currency. Were they even serious? That's, laughable, that's a laughable track record to some extent, except it's not that funny. Some people will say anything for an extra dollar a month. Yeah, it's true. They will. But, um, you know, I've, I've had the same discussion with a lot of people with regard to um, the rise in the price of Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies are one of those types of investments that you you put money into as as kind of a last resort you know you, you put the money in where where you know there's a a, a, a relatively guaranteed return or at least a, a a foreseeable return or as far as you can think there is um but cryptocurrencies were for many people the last option you know they'd already bought up all the cars that they wanted they already got all the the wines that that they like the vintage of and they already got all the whiskeys and the the artwork and all that other bullshit then they start looking around at things to throw money at you know mostly these would be venture capitalists at that point and, and then they throw money into bitcoin you know and so of course when the money goes back out it's going to come back out of us but I expect that it's going to be changing its tune with regard to when we prioritize cryptocurrency in the order of investment. Because the, the route that's going on right now in quote-unquote legacy markets, I foresee that continuing. I, I believe it will continue that the correction there is not over. And when it is, uh, when it's happening, people are going to be looking at places for return. And I really believe that cryptocurrencies are going to see a shit ton of that liquidity that's been sucked out of the the fiat markets. But we'll see. We will definitely see. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. I want to put in some fucking testament. Here we go. Practice what you preach here on Coin Metal. And that, and that was Anthrax with the Devil You Know. <clears throat> and you do have to go with the Devil You Know, rather than drifting off into abstractions of value like wormhole coin or fucking like liquid coin. Um, the, these are just going to be points where the the volume of Bitcoin that somebody has versus what they actually claim to have, what they claim to have and what they actually have. It's going to be the point where the fractional reserve comes in, where they're going to be saying, oh yeah, we got, we got 500 Bitcoin cash when in fact they only have five Bitcoin cash and they've issued 100 wormhole coins per one Bitcoin cash that they have. Because, you know, by then Bitcoin cash will be enough that you're not moving around enough money for them to actually be required to retain the full volume of Bitcoin cash. They just have to be accountable for it somewhere, right? Well, what happens when there's a uh, run? You know, that I, I see on these um, propositions for like liquid coin and stuff like that where the, the trust on them is that they are going to be fully redeemable for Bitcoin. And this is this is the point where I am going to call bullshit. Because at one time when we switched to instead of circulating gold, circulating and gold and silver, we started circulating dollars instead, right? And there was this gold window that you, you could go up there and you could you can hand them the the promissory notes and they give you your fucking gold, right? Yeah, what happened in 1978 or 1976? It was in the 70s. Fucking Nixon basically just said, nah, "I'm gonna close that fucking gold window." It was either him or LBJ, one of the two. I, I'd have to look it up to tell you for certain, but I do know it was either 68 or 78, one of the two, where they basically closed the gold window 
And from then on out, we've been operating on pure IOUs. Okay, the Federal Reserve note, if you read that fucking thing, it says, it doesn't say anything on it about being able to redeem that for gold, silver, or something else. It's a promise to pay at one point or another. And we already know that if we really had a choice in the matter, the U.S. dollar would probably tank tomorrow with as much confidence as it actually has. You know, we, we're basically in, in an extortion fund right now, you know, where we have to circulate it and we have to pay for things in it because that's what's available to pay for things with. Not because it's worth anything, but because people value it enough to circulate value in it. That's about it. They can move monetary value with it. They can pay for things with it. And so they will. And I believe the same will happen with regard to this fucking liquid bullshit and wormhole butt coin. There's no reason why you can't transact on chain with Bitcoin. Except for the fact that these people are planning for you not to. They plan for you to be circulating their bullshit coin instead of Bitcoin. And you will have to trust that they will actually redeem their butthole coin for real Bitcoin. And that that's not a wager I'm willing to make with my money. I don't know about you. Anyway, this is on Tribe.one. Bitcoin sidechain is live and already has 60% of the network. I, I believe that's a misnomer, but we'll continue. And this is by Blockstream. So, of course, it's in their vernacular. Anyway, continuing on. After three years... Blockstream finally launched their Bitcoin sidechain called Liquid, which of beta program started in 2015. It has cr- it is created for high volume traders and exchanges to use as a high liquidity network between each other and right after launch a few already signed up for it. Huge 23 players joined the network right away on the launch day. On the list, we can find companies like Altomi, Altonon, Altonomy, um, Atlantic Financial, Bitbank, Bitfinex, Bit, Bitmax, Bitmex, Bitso, BTC Box, BTSE, Bull Exchange, D Group, Coin One, Crypto Garage, GoPax, Corbit, L2B Global, OKCoin. OK the Rock Trading, Six Digital Exchange, Unicoin, Zappo, XBTO, and Japanese Zafe. Holy sh... Oh my god. Um, if you're trading on any of those exchanges, I would seriously suggest getting your fucking money off of them. Zafe has already been hacked. Okay, and just just to let you know, with regard to Japanese ZAFE, they were a quote-unquote regulated exchange. They were fully licensed to do what the fuck they were doing by the Japanese government. And not only did are, are they, they regulated, right? But it shows it showed how good the regulation was as far as protecting the market. Because... They warned Zafe on more than one occasion that their security was lax and they were going to get fucking hacked. They were warned more than once and then they got hacked and lost $60 million of people's fucking money. So if you if you needed a fucking warning, also Bitfinex is in there. Okay, and if you're unfamiliar with crypto Twitter, you need to get on crypto Twitter and you need to look up Bitfinex. Bitfinex ED. Because that guy has been up their ass for, shit, at least two years now with regard to their participation with Tether, their relationship with Tether. Okay, this relationship hasn't gone away. They're looking for a fucking place to throw their big ass debt. They've got a fucking debt. I am almost, I'm fucking promised this shit. 
that between Zaf, these other entities, and and Bitfinex, they are going to be throwing their fucking debt into this liquid bullshit. Or they're going to be using liquid to distort their fucking their shit. <clears throat> At least on your side. Continuing on. Basically, I think the biggest gainer here is BitMEX Exchange, since without the liquidity transition, when someone went long, there had to be, there had to also, I'm sorry, there had to also watch other exchanges and not be arbitrated on. Currently, the company's CEO, Adam Black, claims they've got 60% of all TXIDs on the network due to this liquidity exchange between each of the parties. And it's Adam Back, not Adam Black. If this happened in the first day, imagine what's going to be coming soon. I am sure other huge exchanges will also will join this. Also, what's wondering what's wondering is lack of Binance on this list. Maybe they will be making their own liquidity system with similar exchanges from China, for example, KuCoin or Billbox or Buybox rather. I'm really wondering, but only time can tell. This is a huge step for big trades and security of books, as well as Bitcoin itself and incoming side chains. You can become a beta user and join the network for free, but there is not too much info about how to actually use it. What is the game changer here? I assume arbitrage will be killed on BTC soon if more companies join. Maybe even all the books will even out. Will Ethereum even create a, a similar system and will there be no arbitrage in upcoming years on anything? Surely this is interesting to watch. Yeah, um, I can tell you right now, it will not neutralize arbitrage. You know, the, as a matter of fact, <laughs> they're, they're creating an arbitrage network for themselves. But... I, I can tell you right now, any of the exchanges that are involved in this bullshit, I if you've got money on them, I would get it the fuck off. Because if they're having liquidity issues, this is b basically a way to hide it. That all of these guys will be operating off of the same... Uh, they're probably going to be operating on the same pool of liquidity. And it is not going to be at a one-to-one -one ratio cash-out availability as stated. You know, that they are going to debase the volume of Bitcoin they have with their, their liquid coins. See, that's how they're able to transfer the money around really quick, is that they've got their own little network, all right? It's all proprietary, and they've got their own coin coin that they use to distribute the value. So, like, you've got, you know, a thousand Bitcoin, right? Supposedly... It's backed at a one-to-one -one ratio, you know, that you have a thousand liquid Bitcoin or, yeah, or, yeah, liquid Bitcoin that they're going to be circulating in the stead of the Bitcoin, right? The, the Bitcoin itself will be supposedly legitimate and they will supposedly have possession ownership over it. Now, how they verify that, I couldn't tell you, probably some sort of PGP key or some shit like that. I don't care. It's trust. Okay, if you're, and I believe that's what's going to happen is they are going to be issuing more liquid Bitcoin than they have Bitcoin to back. And they're going to be using it to try and cover up big ass divots in the, the books of these companies, these exchanges. But they're not going to be able to because in reality, there's only 21, Bitcoin, 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be mined. So if at some point or another there should actually be an audit of liquid Bitcoin on the this liquid network, a, a, a true third party audit, we'll probably find out that these these companies, these exchanges, are circulating fraudulent volumes of liquid Bitcoin between one another on their, their bullshit network. You know, that there's going to be some trust relationship between them and Blockstream about the the actual volumes they possess and so on and so forth. 
and, and though there will be an account uh, coming to account but the I believe that it'll set up the the case for a bailout of crypto exchanges and how that'll work and how that'll translate out into the the open market I, I couldn't really tell you but I, I will say this that I think that the time of distorting Bitcoin's relative value to fiat currencies is coming to a close. That there are several tools being used right now, stable coins being one of them, uh, that are meant to distort the market with regard to how much a Bitcoin is in relative value to US dollars or, or euros or any other currency out there. And that these are these are based at least partially on fraud. That somewhere along the line, the trust has been violated, probably from the get-go, probably as part of the design. There's probably some sort of contract between Blockstream and these guys that yes, we will we will maintain an actual reserve of Bitcoin to be transferred between between parties and whatnot. And these are the rates that we'll be able to do it at, and so on and so forth. And therein will lie the fuckery that Adam Back and, and uh, Blockstream will be issuing way more fucking liquid Bitcoin than they actually have real liquidity for. And if there were any any body that could probably get away with that, I, I or at least for long enough to create a big ass market correction. When their uh, when their fraud is revealed, would be Blockstream, or or possibly Lightning Labs, or or any of the big dev groups. But I I really think that at the the bottom of this, we are going to have an a hack of the sorts we suffered on DAO, the DAO, with Ethereum. And, you know, I, I have very, very little doubt of it. And what that will mean for you is if you don't have your money in a place like a paper wallet or somewhere offline and you're dependent on a third party to maintain your volume, whether it be on an exchange or uh, some other service, uh, good fucking luck. You know, I in. You know, I hate sounding like that because it's very alarmist and I, I I would have to account for a timing or some shit like that for all this shit. But I mean, you you will see plenty of warnings and, and today was probably a big warning for, for a lot of people. Now, how the funds will be redistributed into the marketplace and, and one thing to keep in mind and, and I... I have covered it on this show, and if you've been following this show, you you were well aware of it, that the Federal Reserve actually has their own trading desk. You know, that they, they have they have a trading desk where they, they're interfaced with the Dow and, and other other markets almost intrinsically, directly. And market players go by their calls. They go by what the Fed the Fed does. Well, I I'd be willing to bet that this big ass sell off that we saw today in all of the markets it didn't just happen in crypto. It happened on the Dow. It happened on the Nasdaq. It happened on the Nikkei. And as a matter of fact, we're gonna get into this article here. And and again, I think this could very well be the Federal Reserve simply doing a sell off and uh, getting some of that profit. Anyway, continuing, this is on uh, Zero Hedge. Asian markets crushed by capitulation carnage. This is by Tyler Durden, so I'm just going to assume, yes, penis. Wednesday, October 10th, 2018, 10.13 p.m., no indication of time zone. No national team, no plunge protection team, no RRR cuts, and not a word from Powell. The U.S. equity market massacre is extending overnight as the liquidation crisis smashes into Asia. 
The initial red box is the after hours drop and the second drop as Asian cash, Asian cash markets opened. NASDAQ is now down over 6%. NASDAQ plunged, blah, 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 10%, blah, blah, blah. Looking at charts, looking at charts, 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 lots of down. It's going to be a long night, and that's the end of it. Damn it, Jim. Oh, so this is this is a case where we're actually going to get more out of the comments section than we actually got out of the article itself. And uh, let's go for it. This first one is by Golden Showers. So I watched this movie called Ted or something where a sh- Shireen took a shit on the floor while that bear was blazing it all fierce. Damn, does life imitate art? I've got to go and self-flagellate now. Oh, but here's one more for you guys. Ever walk into a modern art museum and see charts like those above? Just looking at them makes me miss Chicago stretch a canvas, put some jagged lines on it, sell it, and take 10%. Good way to make a buck. Art imitates life, do you see? Turn it sideways or upside down and take a dump in your in the corner. You'll be famous and rich and artistic and all that. Golden Showers said, fuck you. Okay, so get ready because you're going to lose it. You already see it in San Francisco. Life imitating art. The safari. Art news, baby. M-O-M-A. You know, that sanitized version for pussies. Art imitating life. People imitating living humans. All that you can be yours. All that can be yours. Come November 6th, you'll get the vote. You'll get the vote in imitating voice and the voice imitating the vote, and you won't know what the fuck hit you. There is no question in my mind why between now and November, they're dumping the markets. Think about that. I don't have the answer. Just look at it. All that fuck. All that shit. Right now, everyone is taking the rip. You can smell it in the air. Blood in the water. It's hedge time. Do I have to change my name to Golden Showers Arches? Or Golden Arches? Golden Gate Bridge? Yellow Brick Road? Nah. Nah, player. This shit is to spin your head. Trump boosted it, and now it's time once again to go all out in November. Demand a ride-in. I saw some fool the other day in front of me buying ale, and this fool is working overtime getting voting machines ready. Now why is that? When I want a calculator, I get one for a few bucks. Why are they paying dipshits overtime scrambling to get voting machines ready? Like, I never imagined that. All my calculators do math just fine. I thought once you buy it, it calculates without a team. It's not borax, ain't no 20 mules when I launder my shirt, but this is watch the shit go sideways. It's on. Oh. It's on. You're going to get fucked up and fucked up the ass hard in November. So, you have to vote. Vote. And watch that shit like the prawn it is. Someone's going to steal this shit, so you have to open them, them eyes wide shut and get with the program. Fuck the markets. That shit was a whack a long time that shit was whack a long time ago. Vote. Just vote and say it. They only hide your vote because they can steal it. They steal your money, your history, your culture, your everything else. And not just my white ass for the long, for the rest of you, it's worse. Fuck that. It's yours. None of this is kidney stone, stone bullshit makes a deal. God damn it, the markets don't mean shit. Go and vote peacefully and you'll see. The majority doesn't destroy the markets. The minority destroys the markets. And they're working it. See? The only reason the markets could be down is because they were over the top. Nature wastes nothing. If you believe in markets, you believe in black holes and Higgs bosons. While you're looking at aliens and shit, people are taking their time, uh, taking their shit and leaving the table. That's all it is. Once they're gone, 
they're once they are gone and cashed out, the pit crew is going to kick you, kick you the fuck out, just like Clockwork Orange. Just right, right on time, bitches. If you're unhappy with the outcome, why not become an art critic? Yeah, that's that's an interesting te- thing. Oh, let's see. I I think the Fed is just cashing out, really. You know they. You know, people don't think anything about the Fed's interactions with the markets when things are going well. The moment it tanks, we, we, we start we start paying attention. You know, we start wondering, hey, you know, is the Fed having their own trading desk um, a really good thing? You know, is it is that uh, is that is, is that such a good thing? I mean, because we could have market contagion like this when they decide to take their chips off the table. And like I said, we're not just seeing it in crypto. It's fucking everywhere. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I, I think that the contagion... Somebody is fucking wrecked out there. Somebody really fucking big is wrecked out there. Maybe a lot of fucking people, a lot of big people are wrecked out there. They're actually insolvent. They're trading on IOUs. They had to cash out some of the stock that they bought with those IOUs, and they're trying to cover holes that they've got in their in their ledgers. And I, I'm telling you right now, they are going to try and debase some bigger shit coming up the line. You know, we've seen we've seen it in the the smaller markets. You know, if you can call Venezuela a small market, considering their oil output. And I I think that. In the longer term, the shit will rectify. It won't rectify comfortably, but when it does, oil will be somewhere between, I would say, $150 to $200 a barrel, and um, the rest of the market will have to be getting comfortable with paying that much for for energy derived from oil-based products. And this is where, where Trump is very, very smart. And something that I think a lot of people aren't really paying attention to because you do have to be sociopathic just a little bit to see this far down the road. Okay, but imagine this. Imagine for a moment that all of the countries that are currently experiencing disruptions in their markets are no longer experiencing those disruptions. So maybe, uh, I don't know, some hunter gets serious about taking Libya back to a civilized state and gathers up enough people and and munitions that are strewn across the country and and rectifies shit and gets things back out of the hands of the, the criminals that are currently running it. Just imagine for a moment that happens. All that oil that's been bleeding out of Libya is no longer coming onto the market. That source is gone. Syria. Let's just say they get serious for a moment. Right? Say they say say to themselves, okay, it looks like we've got the whole country stable, except for it seems like whoever is coming into the country to start shit is coming in from the Golan Heights region. Why don't we go ahead and um, terminate the annexation that we experienced earlier and uh, retake that ground. <laughs> yeah. Pregnant silence there. Assu- assume for a moment that Russia is also interested in helping that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, those market distortions gone... You know, a, a stable Libya and a stable uh, Syria and a stable Iran because Syria is stable and they're not having to contribute military might or anything like that to securing the region. Imagine what that would do to the price of oil. See, I, I think that would cause oil to go up significantly. That even with the Fed pulling back their dollars that isn't going to change the volume of oil that's in the ground 
And the people that are extracting it are going to want a premium for extracting it because it is a relatively limited source of energy. A precious source of energy. Because it is quick. You know, from, from the ground to processed and refined to your gas tank is relatively quick. We've gotten, gotten pretty efficient at processing that stuff. Getting it ready for you to burn. However... The one thing we haven't been able to do is increase the amount of it that is underneath the ground. We can increase the amount that we can actually access and extract from the ground, um, but we can't increase the amount that is in the ground. And see, when, when you hear people talking about fracking, the process of fracking is like this, that they've already sucked out the majority of the oil that's there, and so they're scraping the sides of the deposit. You know, they're they're like, you know how you get desperate when you when you're all out of pot, and and you scrape the bowl to see if you can gather up enough resin. You clean your pipe, see if you can gather up enough resin just to get high. That that's what we're doing when we're fracking. We're we're scraping the sides of the bowl, and the inside of the bowl, by basically uh, liquefying the walls of the deposit. You know, we spray chemicals down there that break up the deposits, and then we suck it out of the out of the ground, and then we refine out all of the uh, all of the oil that we want. And who gives a fuck about the rest of it, right? I mean, it's just contaminated water. Um. So anyway, they do this, <laughs> and this has been how the U.S. has been basically offsetting the. The drying up of the easy to get to oil, and we've already seen a lot of uh, a lot of backlash for that. There's, it's not a it's not a clean process. But it, where I was talking about with with Trump being mildly sociopathic to be able to see this far ahead, imagine that it does get to one hundred and fifty dollars a barrel, two hundred dollars a barrel. I mean, we might make it economically. Okay, we might not experience the distortion in, in, in the prices of things on the shelf as much. But we're going to be seeing less products coming from China. Less products coming from across the ocean because it requires oil to ship it from China to here. See, so by establishing tariffs and all that stuff now... What Trump is forcing companies to do is to move operations here. And they're not really comfortable with it, but where that will be a positive offset for us is that the manufacturing base will come back here to the United States enough to sustain us here with local supplies. You know, rather than having to ship it across across the ocean, they'll 3D print like a third of it, put it all together here, and and add whatever parts they they couldn't afford to ship across the ocean and manufactured here to it and, and ship it out the door. And that in that way, I think in the next, I we'll experience a significant disruption and and it will justify that movement. You know that that we have uh, tightened up the tariffs and all that and forced companies to get home. But where, where I see that kind of failing, though, is that we're not going to be able to have that with the amount of regulatory burden that companies experience. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they start up in another country to begin with is because they can't afford the, tax, <laughs> the taxes and all the regulatory bullshit that they have to deal with here in the United States. So they go to China, where they really do not give a fuck how many megatons of carbon and other bullshit you eject into the atmosphere. They just don't care. They're more interested in the money that they're going to make off the stuff. And that's all well and good. But when it's not when you can't offset that cost by having it in China because it costs 80 times more to ship it across the fucking ocean and then you have to deal with the tariffs to get it in past the border, you know, it's no longer economically feasible to do that. And so, again, if you can't offset the tax burden there, what are you going to do? You're going to fucking close up shop is what you're going to do. 
either that or you're going to go illicit, you know, is after you've already found the cheapest places to manufacture stuff, the most agreeable atmospheres for it, and then they've started to tighten the noose on you. What are you going to do then? Then you're going to fold up. (laughs) Or you're going to try and find some other market that you can survive in. But it won't be here in the United States. And I think that's the the one glitch in this whole matrix of, of ideas. Is that manufacturers, should they come back here to the United States, and should they be fully compliant with all of the regulations that they possibly can be, that the relative cost of items here in the United States will go up significantly regardless of the fact that they're being manufactured here. And one of two things will happen. Either one, well actually one of three things. One, the Federal Reserve will start printing a shit ton more money. And that's just to uh, get the liquidity going enough that companies feel better about paying people more money. Two, the U.S. economy comes to a grinding halt. Or number three, altcoins and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that are able to transact on-chain and settle on-chain will experience a shift where people are going out of U.S. dollars and into them. So like Verge or Doge or any other proof-of-work coin that people are actually mining... You know that isn't being isn't being uh, offset with a uh, layer two solution, and isn't ruled by some grouping of master nodes or delegated POS or whatever that shit. Those coins are going to experience a rise because you can participate in them as a miner. The networks that you can't participate in, at, at least profitably you won't go to. That, that's just fucking economics. The market will not tolerate any any noxious element that it can circumvent. And I can, cir- I can circumvent having to use Bitcoin off-chain by using Dogecoin or another cryptocurrency out there that is proof-of-work. That allows me to transact on chain. And because of that, I am not going to use Lightning Network. I have absolutely zero intention of ever using it. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's just an abstraction of value pegged on top of Bitcoin that can be debased. Will be debased. That is the whole intention. That is the whole reason for deviating from using Bitcoin is to lie to people, to cheat people, and to steal from people. Etch it in your skull. That is the only reason to go to an abstraction, is to debase the market for it. Debase the volume of it. Destroy the confidence in it. And that's something that I don't think that the people in Blockstream are really thinking about. They're only thinking about the fact that they're going to be like the Federal Reserve and they're going to be able to print money out of the fucking thin air by waving a magic wand around. That's all they're going to be thinking about. They're not going to be thinking about the effect that will have on Bitcoin in the greater econ- in the greater world economy. You know, if I can't trust that the volume of Bitcoin that I have is actually Bitcoin, then I'm not going to use it. If if I'm receiving liquid Bitcoin and I don't know that because nobody is telling me that, um, <laughs> why am I going to use Bitcoin then? I can't trust it. I can't trust that it is what people are telling me it is. I don't think that point has come yet, but I don't think we're all that far from it. Where people will be circulating fraudulent volumes of LBC, LTBC, or whatever the fuck they call that. And that it will have a, a, a greater impact on Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency sphere as a whole. I don't think it'll be a complete loss. I think in the longer term, we will understand that Bitcoin did work just fine before we started putting these artificial limits on it. Limits that were contrary to clear signals we were receiving from the market. 
that the market wanted to use Bitcoin and the volume of transactions was going up. And so increasing the block size, very, very simple, very, very easy fix to the problem was the obvious way to get out of this situation. But instead, those in charge said, no, we're just going to debase Bitcoin because that's more convenient and a lot more fun for us and we'll get a lot richer. So the, the real trick will be what you actually mine. You know, if you, if you mine a variant of Bitcoin that allows for them to do this bullshit, that's on you. And honestly, I think that's the reason why 80% of the Bitcoin miners out there, aren't, or the network out there, isn't bothering to update to Blockstream software because they have no interest in facilitating Blockstream and, and Lightning Labs of divesting them of their market position because that's where this will end. The divestment of the average person from Bitcoin. And it is with that that I'd like to close out this episode. Thank you very, very much for listening. I certainly do appreciate the support. We will be back again on Friday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, I don't, I'd like you all to trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole because it's kind of obvious by now there's somebody out there to take it from you. Thank you again for listening and you all have an excellent evening. As far as our last dance for the evening, I haven't played any Meshuga, so and I haven't played any Prong. Hmm. God damn, that introduces a tough choice. Tough indeed. Fuck it. Meshuga Combustion. Last Dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you very much for listening, and you all have an excellent evening. <laughs>